Greetings, relatives. Uh, Tan Shea, Essay Lawrence Welch, Nitki Kashun. Uh, my name is Sarah Amalia Lawrence Welch, and I'm excited to be hosting this online response from Portland, Oregon, uh, Chinook, uh, Kalapua, and Kakistan land. I'm honored to be sitting here today with presidential candidate Mark Charles to discuss the recent Democratic debate that took place in Houston, Texas on the 11th of this month or 12th of this month, pardon me. Mark Charles is a dual citizen of both the United States and the Navajo Nation. He is presently running as an independent candidate for the office of President of the United States. Mark is the current leading independent candidate in the 2020 race. His campaign has been well publicized throughout Indian country and is gaining publicity in the mainstream press and is also being covered globally by several international publications. Because Mark is running as an independent, he has not had access to many of the same platforms to discuss current issues issues alongside other presidential candidates. This past August, Mark shared the same stage with 10 of the Democratic candidates, including Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Castro, and Marianne Williamson, to just name a few. This was at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum in Sioux City, Iowa. Mark demonstrated that not only can he hold his own, but he can stand out. He has proven that his vision alongside his understanding of the issues and his ability to connect with voters makes him a viable contender in the 2020 election. This response aims to provide a platform where the public can hear uh, his unique perspective in response to the same questions and issues as other candidates, allowing him to share his message for all the people that it can be heard and discussed nationally. If time permits, we will answer some of the questions that were submitted through our website. Um, now, I'm just excited to dive in with Mark Charles. Mark, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank oh. you very much. Wonderful. I trust that you're having a good evening, and I'm very excited for this session. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be with you, S.A. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. So, yat e, Mark Charles, yinish, yeah. Sin bake dene anishle, do to higlini bashichin. Sin bake dene dashiche, do to chitni dashinella. For those of you who have not heard me before, um, please allow me to translate. So in the Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're a matrilineal people and our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother happens to be American of Dutch heritage. And so I say, translated that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sinbuke Dene'a. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni. That's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans where Navajo people. I am joining this meeting tonight from Washington, D.C. And uh, here in Washington, D.C., the host people of this land, the tribes that were here before Columbus got lost at sea, are the Haudenosaunee and the Piscataway. And uh, I just want to honor uh, these nations as the host people of this land and uh, thank them for the, the many, many years and centuries of stewardship they've had over these lands. I like to acknowledge, um, just as S.A. did, the people whose land I'm on no matter where I go. Doing this, it helps me do two things. It's good to remember that these lands were not discovered. And second, it is, uh, it's a good to uh, just remember that there's a history to these lands that predates what's in our history book. There are nations that lived here, they farmed here, they fished here, they hunted here, they raised their families here, they buried their deads here. Um, they, they had their lives here. And these were also the nations that were ethnically cleansed or oppressed or even removed from these lands so that the states and the cities and the towns we live in could be built. And it's very important that we continue to remember these people, acknowledge their presence here, and uh, allow that to um, motivate us to live here, to walk here, to be here in a much more humble manner. As we go into this session, one of the one motivations that we had for doing this event is, uh, as Essa was saying, because I'm not a Democratic candidate, I don't have access to the Democratic debates, and that gives does not that removes me out of the running for a lot of these opportunities to have uh, conversation or even be in the same dialogue with many of the other candidates. I was on the same stage with uh, five of the candidates from the debate and 10 candidates um, overall from the Democratic Party, Frank Lemire, 
uh, Native American Presidential Forum that happened last month uh, in August in Sioux City, Iowa. And while we were there, it was, it was a very good event. I was very happy to be there. And I was been telling people that even if I was not a candidate, I probably would have gone. Because any time we have presidential candidates coming together to talk to Native America, this is something that I want to commend and I want to be a part of. And I love to see that this event took place. And this was labeled a historic event because this was really only the second time that candidates have had any kind of a forum where they spoke to Native people people around Native issues. And this event was even more historic because when the first event happened um, years ago, it, it did not have the top tier candidates. And this past event had five of the top 10 candidates in it, as well as myself there as a Native American candidate, really making this event a historic, uh, um, a historic time. As I sat there and as I've had frustration throughout many of these uh, debates that have gone on in that none of the candidates in any of the three debates have acknowledged uh, the host people of the lands on which they were, they were standing for the debates. However, when we were at, um, when we were at Sioux City, uh, one of the candidates, that would be um, Julian Castro, did acknowledge the, the nations from the lands in Sioux City. And several of the other candidates were very aware that this is what we do as Native peoples, and we, we acknowledge the, the, the nations that were there. And so I was very disappointed when I tuned in to the Democratic debate on September 12th and did not hear a single candidate acknowledge um, the nations that were on the lands in, in uh in Houston, and I just want to acknowledge what nations those are. So the, the lands of Houston uh, were first occupied, or not occupied, but the host people of those lands are the Sana, the Atacapa, and the Karankawa. These were the nations who originally inhabited the land around Houston, Texas. These were the nations that were removed from those lands so that that city could be built up. These were the nations who were ethnically cleansed and oppressed from those lands so that white settlement could move in. And uh, I want to acknowledge today in front of everybody, um, these nations and their job, their, their incredible job of stewarding these lands and of uh, being the host people of the lands in the city of Houston. One of the things that was very troubling for me regarding uh, this lack of awareness and this lack of motivation by the candidates to acknowledge them is, as I said earlier, they saw that this is what we do in Indian country when they were at the Frank Lemire Presidential Forum. And several of them, or at least one of them, Julian Castro, actually did acknowledge the, the tribes on the nation from Sioux City, Iowa. But no one did it um, in Houston and no one did it in the previous debates in Detroit and the one prior to that. And what I find troubling is that all 10 candidates of the Democratic Party who were at the Franklin Lemire Presidential Forum, they made grand promises to the people of how they would remember them, how they would uh, deal with issues like the Remove the Stain Act, how they would um, remember and, and uh, put emphasis and even focus on the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls about how they would include Native nations and Native tribes in their governments and in their, in their policy and decision making and how they would um, use uh, the voice of Native peoples and lift up the voice of Native peoples. And even one of the candidates who probably came in with the most controversy surrounding her, which was Elizabeth Warren, you know, just prior to this uh, forum, she was endorsed by Deb Holland, who is really a celebrity in Indian country for the work that she's doing as a as a congresswoman from the state of New Mexico and, and from the Pueblos there, and her voice along with Sharice Davis and others who have been really just doing the tremendous work within the Congress as Native women. And uh, Deb Holland uh, dropped, <laughs> or not, not Deb Holland, Elizabeth Warren probably dropped Deb Holland's name maybe 15, 20 times during her remarks uh, at the forum and uh, really gave the impression that Deb was a, a crucial voice in her understanding of how she would govern and how she would, um, uh, you know, set policies and work with Indian country. So it's disappointing that Deb Holland's name didn't get mentioned once, 
while Elizabeth Warren was talking about issues and how she would deal with issues of race or immigration or um, mass incarceration or uh, all these other issues that would have huge impact on Indian country. And while Elizabeth Warren dropped Deb Holland's name almost every other sentence at the forum in Tuesday, well, she didn't mention her once uh, throughout the entire time when she was, when she was at the Houston debate. And this is, this is troubling because there's a history of this happening throughout our nation. Many people will remember that uh, during his administration, President Obama was one of the first candidates to actually visit um, Indian country in quite a while. And he went to the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation and he attended a powwow there and spoke with the people there and uh, met with some of the youth there. Later, he actually invited some of those same youth to the White House and they spoke, they actually cried together. And President Obama was moved to tears as he heard about some of the challenges they faced as, as, a, as native youth and the things that happened on their reservation, the suicide and the lack of, of opportunity and the, the, the difficulty with education. And uh, it sounded like it was a very moving, very emotional experience for President Obama. And President Obama is really unique in any president in all of US history because he's the only president that every year of his administration he hosted a, a, a tribal native leaders conference and he invited a leader from every federally recognized tribe to the White House for a day and a half of meetings with him and his staff. And this was really unprecedented and President Obama did a tremendous job of, in that capacity, lifting up the voices of uh, native peoples. Now what many people in the nation don't know is that it was these native youth from Standing Rock who were really the first to really begin raising up the issue of the pipelines and of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And before even what helped bring this to a more national awareness was that several of these youth literally ran from Standing Rock to Washington, D.C. They ran to raise awareness about this pipeline that was coming through their lands and that their people had not been consulted and they were afraid of the spills and what was gonna happen and the environmental damage that would come of this. And it was this run that is what kind of sparked this national awareness of what was going on at Standing Rock. And when they got to Washington DC, they met with some members of, of uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, but they were not able to meet with President Obama. And because of that, they actually had to protest outside of the White House. Now, remind you, this is the same president who met with youth from the same reservation. And some of the youth who were there actually met with him. And he told them that he was going to stand with them and he was going to have their back and he was going to be there. And as I researched why he did not meet with them, on that day, I found out it's because he was starting his vacation that day and he was leaving for Martha's Vineyard. Now, many Democrats have chastised, rightfully, President Trump for golfing while hurricanes are happening in our nation. Many people have chastised President Trump for, for spending an enormous amount of time on the golf course while chaos is happening within his nation. But when Native youth ran hundreds, thousands of miles from their reservation, a reservation President Obama visited, a group of people that President Obama actually met with, when they ran from their homes all the way to the White House, he didn't meet with them. Now, many people will say, well, he did a lot of things behind the scenes, and yes, he did when the Army Corps of Engineers won that lawsuit that was brought by the, 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 the Standing Rock Nation against them about the consultation. It was President Obama working behind the scenes to um, actually get the Army Corps of Engineers to go back and review their consultation process and to look at should they have actually done a better job of consulting and to have meetings around this. He actually got them to even though they won the lawsuit, to go back and, and reevaluate and look at some of the things and to hold off on this pipeline. Um, but it wasn't because they, it was legally required. He was able to do this behind the scenes. But when you have a group of people 
like Native Americans who are the original hosts of this land. When you have a mythology of our colonizers that says that this land was discovered and there were no people here. Sometimes justice is not just about doing the right thing behind the scenes. Sometimes justice is about being willing to stand up and to publicly declare, I see you and I acknowledge you and I hear you. And even though I'm gonna take heat for saying these things and acknowledging these things, I have your back and I'm on your side. And there were numerous times that even President Obama was not willing to stand up and publicly acknowledge Native peoples. A second time that happened was when he signed House Resolution 3326, which was the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. It's a 67 page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD. He signed it on December 19, 2009. He, he was supposed to sign this appropriations bill in a public ceremony, but just a few minutes before the ceremony was to start, they closed the doors and he, public, he signed it publicly. They put out a press release later about this bill and it talked about the appropriations, but nothing was ever mentioned about the bill. Now, if you went back and actually read House Resolution 3326, you would find that on page 45, subsection 8113, was the title, Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. And what followed was a seven bullet point apology. An apology that mentioned no specific tribe, no specific treaty, no specific injustice. Basically said, you had some nice lands. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now just call it all of our lands and we'll steward it together. President Obama signed that bill with that despicable apology in it and he never mentioned it. He never talked about it. I actually hosted a public reading of that bill in front of the Capitol building on December 19, 2012, and I invited, I sent a letter to the White House inviting President Obama and members of his administration to come and join us to own this apology that they gave. And I received a letter back from the White House telling me that neither President Obama nor anyone from his administration would be at our reading of this apology. Now I could go into the reasons of why he didn't publicize the bill. I don't know the exact reason, but I know that this apology, which was a meaningless apology and it really was about self-protecting America. It was not sincere. And it ended with a disclaimer saying nothing and it was legally binding. But President Obama did not stand up and publicly acknowledge this and say whether he liked it or didn't like it, whether it was good or whether it was bad. He signed it and then he buried it. Now I'm not picking on President Obama. I'm using him as an example because he was been one of the best presidents our nation has ever had for acknowledging Native peoples. And yet even he, in these, these are just two moments, this apology and the native youth from Standing Rock. He was not willing, and it has to be because of politics. He was not willing to stand up and say, I see you, I acknowledge you, and I'm gonna stand here publicly with you. And so it, if President Obama, who did all this work, to acknowledge Native peoples behind the scenes, if even he in these very strong instances could not bring himself to acknowledge us publicly. And when these five candidates, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro, Amy Klobuchar, and um, I forget the fifth one now, uh, if they went out of their way to show up at this Native Forum, and then less than a month later, could not bring themselves to acknowledge the people whose land they were having a national debate on, that drains a lot of hope that I have 
that they would actually acknowledge us publicly when it's not just the nation watching, but the entire globe. And so that's why I found what happened in Houston and in Detroit and in the first debate very, very troubling. Because these are candidates who said they would stand for Native peoples, who said they would, they would be concerned with our issues, who said they would acknowledge this history and this past. And yet, when the nation's watching, when the world is watching, when these debates are taking place, even though they know it's the right thing to do, even though they're in a debate at a historically black college and they have a Latino moderator and they're talking about slavery and reparations and they're talking about immigration, they're talking about mass incarceration, they're talking about racism and gun violence and all these horrible things happening in our country and they cannot bring themselves to once mention native peoples then we have a very serious problem. You know, you're right, Mark. Um, this is why I wanted to do this event tonight. And this is why I wanted to do this, so we could bring these things much more to the forefront. You know, Mark, um, that you're speaking on right now, uh, dealing with the invisibility of the indigenous peoples of this nation, uh, we're often an afterthought because we're not seeing and part of a larger systemic issue um, dealing with racism uh, within this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, if I may say, you know, during the uh, um, Obama administration and uh, now the Trump administration, there's been a uh, heightened sensitivity and awareness to these racisms and uh, many of the other issues that go along with that in this country. Uh, some go as far as blaming Obama, some blame Trump. Um, and, you know, I just wanted you to kind of elaborate a little bit on uh, what qualifies to have you really speak on these issues of race, racism. I think you see, you saw this most clearly of anyone who watched the, the Native American Forum, uh, the Frank Lemaire Native American Presidential Forum in Sioux City, Iowa. There was a woman there, her name was uh, Marcel Labu. 99-year-old Army veteran, Native woman. She served in World War II as a nurse. And she was at the forum. And she, she was an elderly woman, 99 years old, and uh, was not able to get on stage very easily. And so she sat in the front row of the forum. And every candidate, she asked them a question about, it's called the Remove the Stain Act, which is what would these candidates do about the 20 medals of honor that the US government awarded to US soldiers who participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. And she introduced her question a little bit differently for every candidate, but the first day of the forum, when I was there merely as an attendee, I wasn't speaking till the second day. And then the first day of the forum, I listened to her question for every single candidate, and twice, at least twice, she brought up the doctrine of discovery. She brought it up with Marianne Williamson, and she brought it up one other time, I forget who she was talking with. And she, she mentioned the doctrine of discovery and, and that was a part of her question regarding the Remove the Stain Act and these medals of honor. And both times the candidates dismissed or ignored her question about the doctrine of discovery. And so when I went up on the second day and after I had introduced myself, I walked over to the side of the stage where she was sitting. I acknowledged her as the elder in the room, 99 year old native woman who is a US Army military veteran, served in World War II. And I said to her how deeply I respected her, how deeply I appreciated her, not only her service to our country, but her boldness and her willingness to ask these questions. And I pointed out that she had twice brought up the doctrine of discovery and no one had answered her. I also pointed out that she's not the first one to do this. We have authors like Steve Newcomb. We have native filmmakers and movie producers who have created documentaries like Sheldon Wolfchild and others. We have people who have gone to the Vatican, people who have traveled to Capitol Hill, people, native peoples who have been trying for decades, years, to bring up the doctrine of discovery only to have these things dismissed. And so, her being dismissed by these candidates on that stage was merely a, a part of a much larger pattern. And then I took the first 15 minutes of my 
time at the forum to address her question. I pointed out that the doctrine of discovery is this series of papal bulls written between 1453 and 1492. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's these papal bulls that collectively are known as the doctrine of discovery. And it's the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and their land is yours for the taking. I pointed out that it was this doctrine of discovery, this dehumanizing doctrine of discovery that became embedded in the Declaration of Independence, where 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the founding fathers referred to natives as merciless Indian savages. I pointed out that this doctrine of discovery gets embedded into our constitution, which starts with the words, we the people, and yet Article 1, Section 2, which is the section of the constitution that decides or determines who is and who is not a part of this union, who is and who is not covered by this document. A, it never mentions women. B, it specifically excludes natives. And C, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. I then pointed out that in 1823, the United States Supreme Court uses this doctrine of discovery and sets it up as the legal precedent for land titles, essentially stating that because natives are savages, we do not have the fee title to this land. We are only here as occupants. Well, Europeans have the right of discovery to the land, the fee title to the land, and therefore they are the true title holders. Rachel, see if she might have gone off the screen. And therefore they're the true title holders. And so I pointed out how that this doctrine of discovery gets referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. That's right, as recently as 2005, the United States Supreme Court, in one of the most white supremacist opinions written in my lifetime, essentially labels natives as savages, says because we've waited, the United Indian Nation has waited 150, 250 years to seek relief from court, from the court, that they cannot regain sovereignty over their own lands. I actually did a TEDx talk on this, and it's online if you want to watch that. But I, I laid out the points of this case. And then I highlighted for the people there that this case, the 2005 Supreme Court opinion, which mirrors the racist and white supremacist opinion written back in 1823, was written by none other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg. See, when you have a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery that props up your land titles, white supremacy becomes a bipartisan value. And our nation doesn't know what to do about it. In the 2016 election, after during the campaign, President Trump promised to make America great again. And Hillary Clinton responded by saying America's great already. In fact, she said in one of the debates, America's great because America is good. She said America's great because America is good. Both candidates agreed that America's past. If Donald Trump says America used to be great and now we're not, and Hillary Clinton says America has always been great. They both agree our past, our history, our foundations are great. They disagreed if we were great in 2016. Donald said no, Hillary said yes. At the Democratic National Convention, President Obama jumps into the fray and he concludes after his term in office that America is pretty great already. And then Cory Booker, African-American senator from New Jersey, he's on the main stage. He's endorsing Hillary Clinton. In his speech, he acknowledges that the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as savages. He acknowledges that the Constitution excludes women, and he acknowledges that we have a three-fifths compromise, but he ends that section of his speech by telling the white 
landowning men at the Democratic National Convention that these things and other dark parts of our history do not detract from our nation's greatness. See, this is one of the challenges we face as a nation. Is we have this mythology, American exceptionalism, which is actually rooted in the lie of white supremacy. And if you look at our history, if you study our history, you will see that we are an incredibly colonial and even genocidal nation. And the way America copes with that is it tells itself it's exceptional. American exceptionalism is a coping mechanism for a nation that's in deep denial of its genocidal past as well as its current racist reality. And so if you are a person of color, like President Obama or like Cory Booker, and you want the vote, the support, and the money of white landowning men, the way that you make yourself safe, the way that you make yourself palatable to this nation that is rooted in white supremacist documents and foundations is you tell them how exceptional they are. And this is the challenge that we face. And I believe I am the only candidate who is willing to not fall into the trappings of this myth of American exceptionalism. I'm the only candidate who's willing and able to acknowledge that the United States of America has some serious foundational level problems. The myth of America is that the United States of America struggles with things like racism and sexism and white supremacy in spite of our foundation. We say we have these great foundations. Dr. King even labeled our foundation a blank check during the civil rights movement. But if you read our foundations, they're absolutely white supremacists. They're absolutely racist and sexist. The United States of America is not racist and sexist and white supremacist in spite of our foundation. The United States of America struggles with racism and sexism and white supremacy because of our foundation. And there is not a single candidate out there that I've met who has been willing to acknowledge that. President Obama can bring himself to say that. Cory Booker can't bring himself to say that. Joe Biden can't bring himself to say that. Elizabeth Warren can't bring himself to say that. Donald Trump definitely will not say that. Hillary Clinton could not say that. There is not a single candidate willing to acknowledge that we have foundational level issues. At the Native Forum, I pointed out to people regarding the question about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. If you have a nation whose statement of values, which is our Declaration of Independence, refers to natives as savages, and whose constitution, which is our constitution, specifically excludes women, then of course no one should be surprised when indigenous women go missing or get murdered and no one gives a crap. Missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is what you get when your Declaration of Independence refers to natives as savages and your constitution excludes women. And I told the, the forum that there are gonna be a lot of, of women, or a, lot of, a lot of candidates who are gonna tell them, we need this new law or this new policy and we can enact these things in order to help our nation care for this very marginalized demographic. But what I said to them, is I said, we don't need a new law. We don't need a new policy. We need a new basis for our laws. It's the basis of our laws, our constitution, that causes this problem. And there is not a single candidate out there who is willing to acknowledge that and who is willing to address that. And I believe that is what makes me the most qualified to rule, to rule, to lead our nation, to help govern this land as we wrestle not with just the racism and the sexism of today, but with the racism and the sexism that is deeply embedded into our history and into our very foundation. I'm sorry, I had some technical errors there for a minute. My uh, network dropped on me. Um, you know, what you're speaking about, Mark, you know, really is um, highlighting 
the idea of marginalization in these communities. And we know that marginalized people um, tend to have uh, a lot more um, trouble with their comeuppance than say the, the uh, power demographic. Uh, that being said, I'd really like you to touch on um, the opioid issues, you know, as they do affect uh, marginalized communities um, and the rest of the nation. Thank you. Yeah, so when we look at the issue of the opi opioid epidemic and the health crisis that we're dealing with, again, and this also goes into the issues of mass incarceration, um, where we have a large number of people who are serving time in jail, mostly people of color, who are serving time in jail for nonviolent drug-related offenses. And we have to understand this from a historical standpoint. So. Many Americans don't know this, but the United States of America has actually never abolished slavery. If you read the 13th Amendment, what it states is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereas the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place under its jurisdiction. The 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. Now, it's been our, said that it's our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, whose crowning goal of ach achievement was the 13th Amendment and the abolishment of slavery. But most people don't understand that Abraham Lincoln was a blatant white supremacist. If you read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Abraham Lincoln and Judge Douglas absolutely agree on things like white supremacy. During one of his first debates, Abraham Lincoln said, I have no intention of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor allowing them to intermarry. He said, there's a physical difference between the white and black race, which will ever forbid the two from living in terms of social and political um, equality. And as long as we have to remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, said Abraham Lincoln, believes that the superior position belongs to the white race. He said something almost verbatim in the very next debate, just a month later. Judge Douglas, who wanted to make a distinction between himself and Abraham Lincoln, accused Lincoln of, of wanting to make citizens of African people, of, of former slaves. And Abraham Lincoln said, I have no intention of making citizens. This is the same debate where he said he's not going to make voters or jurors of them. He says, I think the Constitution allows us to make citizens of, of African Americans. But if the state of, of Illinois were to exercise such, such a, a right, I would be opposed to it, he, he said. So later, Judge Douglas accused Lincoln of applying the Declaration of Independence to black people. And Abraham Lincoln basically said, well, He said, I think the founding fathers meant to include all people, but he did not mean, they did not mean they were equal in all respects. They did not mean they were equal in size, intellect, or stature. Now he's not talking about height, or he's not talking about individuals. He's not saying some people are taller, some people are shorter, some people are smarter, some people aren't. He's talking about race. And he absolutely believed that the superior position belonged to, to the white race. Now he was against chattel slavery, not because he cared about black people. There's a quote hanging in the Lincoln Memorial that says, if I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. He didn't care about black people. He was afraid that the issue of slavery was gonna pit white landowning men against each other so much that they would destroy each other and ruin this white supremacist nation, this union they were erecting. That was the biggest threat, he said, in the Lincoln-Douglas debate. And so as president, Abraham Lincoln had a challenge, which is he wanted to end chattel slavery, but he didn't want to make citizens of black people. And he didn't think they were equal. So what do you do with them? Well, you put a clause in your 13th Amendment. You keep slavery legal in prison. And you allow a white judge, a white jury, a white law enforcement officer to remove the rights of your people of color on a whim. This tool of mass incarceration was the brainchild of Abraham Lincoln because of his white supremacist viewpoint 
and his desire to not allow black people to become full citizens. This is on top of all the genocide and ethnic cleansing he enacted against Native peoples, which we'll talk about later. And so President Reagan, in the 1980s, when he declared his, declared his war on drugs, which technically was a war on race, and he used it to criminalize drug use and begin incarcerating people of color for their addictions. And then this, ish, this, this, this tool of mass incarceration was really perfected by Clinton. And mass incarceration skyrocketed through him. We had this school to prison pipeline that was being built. So if you look at opioid addiction and use and death by opioids throughout the last two or three decades, in the 1990s, it was people of color who were dying at a higher rate than white people from opioid addiction. In the late 90s and early 2000s, the two met and almost at the same rate, white people and people of color were dying of opioid addiction. And then in the early 2000s, white people went higher. And then 2005, 2008, they skyrocketed and went through the roof, dying at much higher rates than people of color from opioid addiction. And this is when criminalized drug use now became a public health crisis. This is when our nation, instead of incarcerating people who struggled with addiction, we began developing life-saving techniques so that we could actually equip our law enforcement and our first responders to save lives while they were on the streets rather than just throw people in jail. Now that was a good response, but it took white people dying from this crisis in order for that to be enacted. And so we absolutely have an opioid problem here in our country, but it's not a new problem. It's just been in the past decade or so that white landowning men with suits and ties have learned how to profit from selling drugs. But we've had drug problems and addiction problems and death by drugs. They've been around for years and years and years. The media is just catching on right now because now we're, we're not criminalizing it anymore. But now we're treating it like the health crisis that it actually is. And so now that we are doing things like legalizing marijuana and decriminalizing drug use, and treating it like the health crisis that it actually is. But now we literally have our prisons filled with people of color because they were put there under President Reagan and President Clinton and President Bush. And so what, what do we need to do? You know, all of the candidates were talking about, they would, they would go through and, and, and grant clemency to some of these prisoners and allow people who are in incarcerated for non-criminal or non-violent drug use, they would, they would grant them clemency and, and let them be freed. And that may help against one section of the demographic, but that's not gonna solve the problem. The problem that we're facing is we have never abolished slavery. Slavery is still legal in the United States of America in prison. So if we want to deal with the issue of mass incarceration, if we want to deal with the issue of, of, of what do we do with, with all the people that we've incarcerated from when we're criminalizing drug use, we don't just need to grant clemency. We need to actually abolish slavery. As we're dealing with these questions, there's, there's been a debate going on within the Democratic Party about reparations, and I'm so grateful this debate is happening. This is a great conversation we need to have. And I think almost all the candidates are in favor of paying reparations to the ancestors of former slaves. And I absolutely agree with that. But I'm concerned. I'm concerned because if you look at the way white America 
the U.S. government and corporate America deals with criminal liability is they will settle these class action lawsuits like some of these pharmaceuticals are doing now where they will let all of these people opt into these lawsuits and you paid maybe pennies on the dollar of what actually happened. And then after this class action lawsuit is over, you lose your right to actually sue and go after just go for justice after these organizations. And so while I absolutely believe that reparations need to be paid to the ancestors of former slaves, I am deeply, deeply concerned that if we allow white America to financially pay out reparations, and I promise you they will not pay it out unless there's a clause that says they can close the close the page, close the book on this chapter, close the page on this chapter. They will not pay reparations until they can absolutely guarantee they can put this thing to bed. And if we allow white America to pay reparations before we actually abolish slavery, I fear we may never abolish it, period. And so as a candidate for president, in 2020, one of the core planks of my platform is that the United States of America needs to once and for all abolish slavery. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, period. We need to remove that clause from the 13th Amendment. That is how we begin to solve the problem of mass incarceration. That is how we begin to solve the problem of criminalizing drug use. That is how we begin to even the playing field so that this nation cannot use its criminal justice system as a way to remove the civil rights of its citizens. We have the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the entire world. And we incarcerate our people of color at three to five times the rate that we incarcerate white people. If we want to solve this problem, this is a foundational level problem. We need to abolish slavery. And that's what I intend to do. One of the core planks of my platform is the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the truth and reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. I wouldn't call ours truth and reconciliation though because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. I would call ours truth and conciliation and I think we need one sooner rather than later, which is why it's at the center of my platform. After their Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, the South African nation wrote an entirely new constitution. I don't know if we need to write an entirely new constitution, but I definitely think we need to edit our current one. On my website, which is wirelesshogan.com, that's my personal website, I actually published a blog post about three or four years ago when I read through the entire constitution, front beginning to end, starting with the preamble, going through the 27th Amendment. It was during this reading I noted that we had 51 gender-specific male pronouns and not a single female pronoun. It's then I noticed all the sex and white supremacist language embedded in the Constitution. And so rather than amending it, I edited it. I used the strikethrough font. So when you read the 13th Amendment, it says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. And that clause is struck out. You can still see it, but there's a strike through font through it. We have to remove that clause from that amendment. Every place where we had a gender specific male pronoun, I changed it either to a proper noun or to a gender neutral pronoun. We have to edit our constitution. We have to deal with white supremacy, the racism, the sexism embedded into our foundation. And this is just one of the proposals I have of how we can move forward, but we need this national dialogue on race, gender, and class. This is how we deal with our foundation. And these are the level of changes I think we need to make in our country.
Um, you know, Mark, you touched on quite a few things um, from speaking on opioids to mass incarceration. And uh, one of the things that really struck me in there was, uh, you know, mentioning paying out reparations, which is something that does need to happen um, to rectify a lot of wrongs that have been done in the history of this country. Um, but, you know, the, the thought of wiping our hands clean of this history by doing so um, is something that we have to make sure doesn't ha happen. And uh, speaking on that, when it comes to, um, you know, money and finances to this country, um, I wanted you to actually kind of go into uh, your thoughts on foreign policy um, as we deal with, you know, uh, economic uh, strife in that. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so one of the questions that was brought up to the candidates in the last forum was what they would do, how quickly would they withdraw our troops from the nation of Afghanistan? It's been noted that this is the longest running war in the history of our country. And um, they were asking candidates, would they, would they withdraw our troops right away? And in giving their answers, um, two of the candidates, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden, stressed that they had actually been to Afghanistan and uh, Elizabeth Warren said that she had visited with John McCain and had talked to people on the ground. I'm assuming people from Afghanistan about what does success look like? What does a victory look like here? And she said she could not get a clear answer and use that as justification as to why they would pull troops out because there is no clear answer there. Now, this next part I'm gonna say, people of color will understand what I'm saying. This might come as a bit of a shock to white people, but I've, I've traveled quite a bit internationally. I've gone a lot of places around the globe. And because I'm native, because my skin is dark and my hair is long, I rarely get identified as an American, at least until I start speaking in English. Um, and so oftentimes I will be approached by people and they will speak to me in their native tongue whether it's in Bengali when I'm in India or whether it's in Spanish when I'm in South America, um, you know, people come up and they will speak their, their native tongue to me. As a result, I've been able to sit in a lot of rooms with people from foreign nations and I've began, been able to hear their dialogue before the white American came into the room and I've been able to hear their conversations after the white Americans leave. And even when people find out I'm American, but because they know I'm native, they will talk to me differently than they will typically talk to white Americans. And there's no other way to say this except bluntly, but the world does not respect the United States of America. The nation knows what we've done. The world knows what we've done. They know what we've done to African people. They know what we've done to native people. They know that they've experienced our colonialism firsthand. And while many people may speak well to white Americans when they're in the room, that's not their reaction towards them before they come into the room, and that's not their reaction towards them after they leave the room. There is a lot of anger, there is a lot of frustration, there is a lot of, a lot of emotion. And most of the world does not respect the United States of America. Most people, have two goals when dealing with white America. How can I get some of their money? And how can I keep them from blowing me up? Why? Because the United States of America is obsessed with power. Power is the ability to act. You have strength, you have muscle, you have money, so you can act, you can do the things you want to do. But for power to be effective, you have to demonstrate it. So we can't just tell people we're rich. We have to flaunt our money. We have to spend it. We have to, we have to show it. We have to have this powerful military. We have, to, we have to bribe these officials. We have to do these things. We have to give out this aid. We have to do all these things with our money so people know how wealthy we are so they will be motivated to appease us. We're also the only nation in the world that's dropped nuclear bombs during wartime, even on civilians. As a result, we've demonstrated to the world, if you mess with us, we are not afraid to drop nuclear bombs on you. What do you think the influence of the United States of America would be in this world if we went bankrupt and we lost our nuclear arsenal? 
I fear there's not many nations that would respect us. Why? Because we have a ton of power, but we have very little authority. If power is the ability to act, authority is the right of jurisdiction or the permission to act. And again, while we have a ton of power, we have very little authority. And so if Elizabeth Warren can go in as a white woman, a U.S. senator, alongside John McCain, a military veteran, and speak to people on the ground in Afghanistan and think that she can get an honest answer from them about what success looks like, that's pretty naive. Joe Biden said pretty much the same thing. That's very naive. You're not going to get a straight answer from them. Again, they have two concerns. How can I get some of your money? And how can I keep you from blowing me up? Let me highlight how this looks. The U.S. has been at the center of peace talks in the Middle East for decades. The United States of America has been working alongside Israel to negotiate peace in the Middle East for decades. And the, the Palestinian and the Israeli conflict, the Jewish settlements and the, and the, 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 the violence and the colonialism that's happening there, has, the U.S. has been at the center of that for decades. And we've sent white land-owning men, wave after wave of them, to go and try to negotiate peace. And most recently, we sent Jared Kushner. President Trump's son-in-law. And he came up with this, what I'm sure he thought was a great plan to have some economic incentives and investment into the Palestinians. And instead of giving them sovereignty over their lands, we'll just give you some money so that you can build up your tourism. See, this is what happens when you send white landowning men who can't even name the native nation that was ethnically cleansed from the land their house resides on. And we send those people overseas to try to negotiate peace over a centuries old land conflict. It's insane. It makes no sense. White land-owning American men should be the last people we want negotiating peace in the Middle East. Because they haven't even acknowledged and reckoned with the injustice of their own nation and what happened for the land that they're living on. How can they ever see clearly to negotiate peace in a place like the Middle East? And the, the world knows this. The Palestinians know this. The Israelis even know this, but they... There's other dynamics at play there, which is why they saddle up to us, but I'm not going to go into that right now. And so we as a nation, we, we have to understand that because we haven't dealt with our history and because of the way we flaunt our money and bomb people who piss us off, while there's a lot of people who will do our bidding, there are very few people or nations who actually respect us. And so... I would not make a promise right now to pull out of Afghanistan the minute I became president. I also wouldn't make a commitment I'm going to be there long term. I would work to find and to appoint a delegation that probably would include some native elders, probably would include some ancestors of former slaves, that probably would include women, and I would send them there, and I would ask them to represent our nation. I would ask them to get to know people on the ground, and I would try and see if we could get a bit more honest answer of what does success look like in these places. We have to rethink the way we do foreign policy. We have to have a deeper understanding of our own history and what that history does to our role in the world. Just a few weeks ago, you know, when we have Saudi Arabia getting bombed, their oil fields getting destroyed by drones, and yet it's America 
the United States of America, that saying, we're locked and loaded. Just show us where to point our guns. This may be a surprise to most many white Americans, but the world, the global community knows US history better than most Americans do. They know what we've done. They know what we continue to do. And many of them experience the oppression that we continue to enact on the world. They also see our money and the way we flaunt it around and they also want some of that. And so they speak very highly of us while our white landowning men are in the room. But the minute they leave, I can promise you from experience, the dialogue changes. And we need to do something about that. We need to acknowledge our own history. We need to approach this in a much more humble manner. We need to completely rethink our foreign policy. And that's what I would do as president of the United States. You know, Mark, you uh, made a, a few comments when uh, what you were saying regarding, you know, our, our role as a country in the world and how we're viewed and, um, you know, the statement of white landowning men being put in situations where they don't understand um, what they're up against or what they've done. And uh, that actually is um, pretty relevant as to uh, what transpired yesterday. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to bring up the topic of climate change and, um, you know, what meaningful actions you're planning on taking um, to deal with these ever present issues. Um, it is such a large topic and we don't really have many answers for it. And uh, regarding yesterday, you know, there was um, a global event that happened, the climate strike that was primarily led by youth. Um, I just wanted your thoughts on, on those topics. Thank you, yes. Um, so regarding climate change, and I remember one of the questions they asked the candidates, of what would you do, um, what meaningful action would you take on climate change? When we look at what's going on with the climate right now, um, we have the Republican Party and President Trump um, bragging about this incredible economy they've created and how they've created jobs and they've created wealth and they have boosted the American economy to, if you listen to President Trump, the greatest it's ever been. But they've done that while trashing the environment. They've done that while exploiting the middle class and the lower class and catering to the 1%. They've done that while reducing or getting rid of environment protection laws. They've done that while increasing uh, pollution and, and, and air quality standards or decreasing air quality standards. That's easy, I, anyone. You have to be an idiot to not be able to grow an economy while you're completely exploiting your environment and your people. That's an easy thing to do. I wouldn't brag about that, President Trump. That's the simplest way to grow an economy. On the other side, we have the left. And we have them talking about how we can grow our economy through a Green New Deal and through green energy and green investments. And we can tackle the issue of climate change while we still grow our economy. There's a story, there's a documentary out there, it's called Homeland. It talks about different native nations struggles to to have sovereignty over their homelands. And one of the nations they highlight in this documentary is the Athabascan people who live up in the Arctic Circle. And one of the leaders of, of the Athabascan, he was on this documentary and he was talking about their creation story. And he said that in their creation story, there is a piece of the caribou heart in the, in the human heart. And there's a piece of the human heart in the caribou's heart. It creates this relationship of dependence between the two. And they lived right along, along the migration route of the caribou. And every year the caribou migrate north in the spring to calf, and then they migrate south in the fall and the winter to spend their winters in the, in, the, in the warmer climates. And he was saying that it didn't matter what was going on 
in their people, in their communities in the spring, whether they were prospering or whether they were in famine. He said it didn't matter. They never hunted the caribou as they headed north to Calf. They said that because if they did hunt while they were going north to Calf, while they were carrying their young, they would destroy this relationship. And while they might eat better for a year or two, eventually they would wipe out the caribou and they would be in a very bad situation. Now, many environmentalists love this statement by him. But then they were appalled when he said, but we hunt them regularly in the, in the fall and the winter when they go, when they go south. And see, in, in a lot of environmental areas or environmental understandings in the West, nature is something you either preserve or it's something you exploit. There's, there's not a lot of, I mean, there's some talk, but not enough talk about how do we live in a subsistent manner with our environment. And so he said, well, we need the caribou's meat to, to survive. We need their, we need their, their um, you know, their furs or their skin to, to make our clothes. We need them for our, our survival. And so we hunt them when they go south, but we don't hunt them when they go north. Even if we're in famine, we don't hunt it when they go down. Well, Western culture, the United States of America, have been hunting the caribou, metaphorically, as they've headed north for 250 years, if not for 5, 500 years. And we've reached a tipping point. And we now have to save the environment. And I don't think we can have, we can guarantee a robust economy while we're trying to save the environment. And what I love about what happened this weekend is that the youth of the world, they understand this. They understand that if they themselves don't act on climate change, even while they're still in high school, there will not be a world or an environment left for them to inherit. And so they are acting now. They are fighting for the right to vote at 16. They are fighting for their, for, they're looking for ways to clean up the plastic island. They are having these climate strikes. They are saying to the nation and to the leaders of these nations that you need to act now. You've been hunting the caribou as they've headed north for hundreds of years, and we have reached a tipping point, and if we don't act now, and so for me, the first action I would take on climate change is I would prepare our nation that we cannot guarantee we are going to have a prosperous economy while we try to save the environment. In fact, we will probably need to live with less convenience. We will probably need to live with less security. We will probably need to live with less of a lot of things in order that we can nurse our environment back to health because it's not going to happen overnight. And we need to change the way we live and change the way we do society and change the way we transport ourselves and change the way that we produce energy we need to make a lot of changes and making those changes is not going to be necessarily prosperous and so one of the first actions i will take is i will begin to prepare our nation and say we are we are facing such a crisis that asking how we can face this crisis while we still prosper our economy is asking the wrong question. It's not that we don't need to be concerned about the economy, but we cannot put it first. We have a more pressing need, which is the survival of our species, the survival of our world. And that may mean making some difficult and tough choices. And we need to prepare ourselves to be able to do that. And so that will be the first and the most meaningful action on climate change that I will take is I will prepare our nation for the very difficult work and task that we have ahead of us. And I, I, it's not that I, I don't think we can, we can manage this task. I think we can. 
but we have to prepare ourselves. We have to speak honestly to one another so that we can all prepare to make these sacrifices so that we can do what needs to be done on the climate, on the, on the environment. You know, Mark, um, you spoke on the process of us, you know, limiting our conveniences as a society. And um, I kind of want to relate that into um, the topic of immigration, you know, especially at our southern border right now, but more so that we rely uh, so much in the United States on uh, foreign workers. Um, I wanted to have you kind of elaborate your thoughts on uh, immigration policies between southern borders, the rest of the world, and even our northern border. Yeah, so thank you. Let me talk briefly about immigration. I, we're running out of time here. We have about 20 minutes left. That the webinar is going to end in about 20 minutes. So I want to touch briefly on immigration, and then I want to get into our last question. But um, regarding immigration, you know, I was, I was out... This was years ago, almost over a decade ago. I was living on our reservation. Um, and I was with uh, my, my wife and our son and I were living in a very remote section of our reservation. We were six miles off the nearest paved road on a dirt road. We were living in a one-room hogan with a dirt floor and log walls. We had no running water, no electricity. Our neighbors were rug weavers and shepherds. And I was out herding sheep one day with one of the, one of the shepherds at the sheep camp we were living on. And this was early 2000s, President Bush was in office and immigration reform was just beginning to take place in the national dialogue. And I said to my friend, who's a boarding school survivor, he speaks better Navajo than English, lived most of his life on the reservation. I said to him, I said, you know, the nation's talking about immigration reform. I'm curious, what's your thoughts on it? And he said, well, there's already so many of them here. Maybe we shouldn't worry about borders anymore. Now he said that, and if you've heard, if you, if you hear that, you immediately begin thinking he's talking about the 14 million undocumented who've come over our southern border. But because we're both native, because he's a boarding school survivor, because we're on the reservation, you have to at least pause and ask, is he talking about the 14 million or the 350 million undocumented immigrants? And I love the, the ambiguity so much, I didn't even ask him to clarify. But after that, I began teaching and telling people that without natives at the table, the United States of America is incapable of comprehensively and justly forming immigration law. Without natives at the table, all you have is one generation of undocumented immigrants trying to figure out what to do with another generation of undocumented immigrants. And there's no integrity in the dialogue. I don't care if you're trying to build a wall to keep people out, or you're trying to open up a gate to let people in. If native peoples, the indigenous nations of Turtle Island are not a part of your conversation, you don't have the authority to do either. If you're dealing with stolen land and the people you stole it from are right in front of you. Again, it doesn't matter if you're building a wall to keep people out or tearing one down to let people in. You don't have the integrity to make either decision. We need to completely rethink the way we do immigration reform and how we think about immigration reform. We need to bring the native nations of Turtle Island into this dialogue so that we can talk about it from a very, very basic level and deal with the history of our nation and the history of, of injustice by immigrants. Did this go out? Can you hear me? Okay, we thought the sound died, sorry. And so this is one of the things I would do, again, like everything else I'm doing, I would, I would start by bringing native nations, native peoples, native elders into the conversation on immigration reform. I would challenge our nation to think back and look back and look at our history and what, what we've done throughout our history. And, and then we would begin to have the discussion is what does that mean to move forward in a better way? How can we, 
how can we actually become the nation we say we want to be? People talk about we're this nation of immigrants who welcomes the foreigner and the stranger and who, who, who cares for the least. And I'm like, when in our history were we ever that? Immigration has always been a problem here in the United States of America. We have this mythology that what it says on the Statue of Liberty is true, but that has rarely ever been true. And so we need to deal with our actual history and decide what do we want to do. And at the center of that conversation, we need the native nations of Turtle Island to not only be in that conversation, but even to help lead it. So I want to challenge our nation that we have to think differently about immigration reform than we've ever thought about it in the past. I would love to see our immigration policy not just have power behind it to enforce it, the strength of a wall, or the power of our guns, I'd love for our immigration policy to actually have authority because it was written in partnership and with the voices of native peoples and native nations to help shape the policy and find a good way to move it forward. Now, um, you just made one last comment there about using guns as a method to um, control the the borders of this country and uh, within our own borders we're struggling with gun control with regulation and with um, mass shootings and, and shootings on a daily basis um, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on that yes so this is a very big issue and I really hope that this seminar webinar doesn't end um, it, I don't think it's going to shut off automatically we had set up for 90 minutes but I will do my best to answer this question the issue of gun control and the history of our nation of gun violence is something that we have to learn how to deal with. And, and this, these two topics, immigration reform and gun control, are two issues that our nation has no clue how to deal with. If you want to get a room full of screaming people quickly, all you have to do is bring up immigration or gun control, and you will have a room screaming at you within a few seconds. Our nation doesn't know how to talk about these things. And again, it goes back to the fact that our nation doesn't know its history. So if you read the Second Amendment, and I want to actually read it for you here so we actually can, we can have a dialogue about it. But if you read our Second Amendment, what it says is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Second I'm actually very short and simple. It's four phrases, four statements separated by commas. I'll read it one more time. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, if you listen to the gun control debate going on out there, they will, on, on one hand, you will have people on the left or who are advocating for gun control say, well, it's a well-regulated militia, meaning we have the ability to regulate gun control. And then you have people generally on the right, people who, who are what they call themselves pro for Second Amendment. They will say, but the, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed upon. And so there can be no laws about gun control. And this debate goes back and forth until everybody's screaming at each other. But you have to understand the history of this land. So the, the Second Amendment was passed as part of the Bill of Rights, which I believe was in 1791. This is like three or four years after the writing of the Constitution. Now, the Constitution um, was written after the Declaration of Independence. A lot of people say the Declaration of Independence is kind of our statement of values before we became a nation. This is who we want to be. This is what we want to believe. And if you read and understand the history of the Declaration of Independence, so in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains. And he essentially says to the, the 13 colonies who are here that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonies. They wanted access to those lands. So they wrote their letter of protest. And in their letter, they accused the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. And they went on to say that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is the complete destruction of all ages, sections, and conditions. I might not have quoted that last part perfectly, but it's along those lines. So the Declaration of Independence is 
the colonies wanting to keep the right of discovery to these empty Indian lands and afraid of the merciless Indian savages who are being brought upon the inhabitants of their frontier. And so why does this nation need a second amendment? Well, they need a second amendment because of the merciless Indian savages, because of their destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. This is why they wrote the Second Amendment. They, they wanted protection from our people. And you see that they established a militia in the Second Amendment. Now, a militia is a civilian army that's kind of lying in wait to be engaged by the government to help fight on their behalf. Well, throughout the history of this country, a militia has been used numerous times for the ethnic cleansing of native peoples. After the Dakota War of 1862, after Abraham Lincoln hung the Dakota 38, they actually put a bounty on the Dakota chiefs, and then they organized a militia to help hunt them down. After that militia had run its course, they wanted to make sure that the, the natives were still being hunted in Minnesota. And so they raised the bounty to encourage regular civilians to continue to hunt the native peoples. In California, which the governor of California, 1851, already was acknowledging that they were in a war of extermination against native peoples. And it wasn't going to end until they were completely extinct. So many people in California were prospecting for gold that many people actually found it was more lucrative to instead hunt natives and scalp us and turn our scalps in for the bounty the government was paying. So the militias were designed and used for the ethnic cleansing and genocide of native peoples. This is why if you read the apology I mentioned earlier, and you read the language of the apology, it apologizes on behalf of the citizens of the United States. Why? Because it was the citizens who was helping hunt down and kill and commit genocide against Native peoples as part of these militias. Now, the second half of the Constitution, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. The people. The Constitution begins with the words, we the people. Article 1, Section 2 clearly defines who people means. People means white people. People means white men. The Second Amendment was not written to arm people of color. The Second Amendment was not written to arm minorities. The Second Amendment was written to arm white men. If you look at gun control within our history, in 1921, after a young man in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was accused of assaulting a young white woman, the people of the town took him and they were going to lynch him, even though she had declined to press charges against him. And there were many prosperous black families in Tulsa at that point. It was called Black Wall Street because it had the highest number of black owned businesses of any city in the country. And they went to protect this young man. And the, the, the interaction turned violent. And the city began deputizing white people. And they went into this black section of town where Black Wall Street is, and they basically barricaded it off and sent in hundreds of armed white people and they started shooting the black people who were there over a period of 48 hours, and they literally burned 35 blocks of the city. They actually flew airplanes over the buildings and dropped homemade bombs out of them. These are civilians, white people, dropping homemade bombs on top of these buildings. They were looting and burning all of these businesses and these homes throughout this 35 block section of Tulsa. This was in 1921. No gun control was enacted after that. In fact, the event was hardly even spoken about. It wasn't even really covered in the newspapers. 
Not a single insurance claim was paid out for this injustice because they labeled it a riot. Our nation never has dealt with this massacre of African American people in Tulsa. And that massacre did not motivate our nation to enact gun control. However, in the 1960s, in the city of Oakland, in California, the Black Panthers were learning that the Second Amendment applied to them. And they began showing up and following the police and observing their arrests and reminding the black people who were being arrested and even harassed by the police of their rights. And they were standing there armed with their weapons out in the open because it was not against the law. And then one day they went in, I think this was in May, and they went into the Capitol and they carried their arms openly, their weapons openly into the Capitol building in California. They were disarmed and they tried to arrest them, but because they weren't breaking any laws, they couldn't. And within three months of that, after I believe it's called the Milford Act, gun legislation and gun control was enacted within California. And it had the support of the NRA. Why? Because the Second Amendment. It's not about the right of black people to carry guns. It's about the right of white people to carry guns. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This amendment is dripping with the implicit bias of white supremacy. This amendment was written for the purpose of creating militias to ethnically cleanse and commit genocide against native peoples and to arm white people so they could terrorize black people. This is why we have a second amendment. This is why it was written. This is why it was created. And this is how it's been enforced throughout our nation's history. In 2016, the election, President Trump was speaking at Dort College, Iowa, conservative white town, evangelical school. I was on that same stage just a few months earlier in November of 2015 talking about the doctrine of discovery. And I noticed that he was there in like January or February of 2016. And he gave a speech from the same stage. And I listened to the speech. And in that speech, he said that he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue in New York City and shoot people and he wouldn't lose a single supporter. Now, most of the nation thought he was talking about murder. He thought he was saying he could stand up and commit murder, but he said he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not lose a single supporter. Let's change the word Fifth Avenue to Walmart. He's not advocating murder. He's advocating white nationalist terrorism. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue, Walmart, start shooting people. I won't lose a single voter, is what President Trump said. This is how the Second Amendment was designed to work. You have your leaders, whether it's Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump, gaslighting racial issues. You have white people who are armed and ready to enact some of this violence. So you have a young man who drives all the way to Houston several hours and begins shooting people. This is why we have a Second Amendment. And this is why just a few weeks later, another white man went into another Walmart completely armed. He was there because he wanted to test if he still had his Second Amendment rights. There's been a lot of debate about the Second Amendment. There's been a lot of debate about gun control. 
But when you have an amendment that is dripping in the implicit racial bias of white supremacy, that was meant to arm white people so that they could commit genocide and ethnic cleansing of Native peoples and terrorize black people. That type of amendment has no place in a society that claims to value freedom and equality and diversity and pluralism. I'm not saying we have to get rid of all guns, but I'm saying our second amendment is so deeply flawed and dripping with so much implicit racial bias, I don't think there's a way we can fix it. I think we have to get rid of it. I actually liked what Cory Booker said when he said, we have to start talking about licensing guns. It's a great idea. We need to get rid of the second amendment and begin licensing guns, just the same way we license cars and drivers. Gun ownership in a city, in a nation that is founded on colonialism and white supremacy and has slavery and genocide in its past, we have demonstrated over and over and over we are a nation that is not able to have a right to bear arms. we so quickly misuse it and abuse it and fall back into the trappings of how our nation was founded. And so I think we need to begin looking at how do we license these guns. Or having a gun is, is, is a privilege you have to own, you have to earn and demonstrate. It's not a right you have until you abuse it. And this is deeply rooted in our history. And I, I, we have to learn how to deal with this. We have to learn how to wrestle with this. Um, you know, Mark, this was a, a very heavy topic to discuss as much as everything else we have gone over today. And, um, you know, it can't, I can't help but think about, uh, you know, the, what you're going to be up against with some of the response to this, um, these comments today and your, um, your policies and thoughts. And uh, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think you're going to be able to show your resilience, not only as an individual, um, but as a presidential candidate and potential future president of this country? It's a great question. I actually liked when they asked that question of the, of the candidates in the debate as well. When I moved with my family from Denver, Colorado, back to the Navajo Nation, and we lived in this Hogan six miles off the road on a dirt road, no water, no electricity, we prepared ourselves to live off the grid. We prepared ourselves to haul our water and use an outhouse and cook by over a camp stove or over an open fire and to use, um, you know, these these types of resources but what took us by surprise was how marginalized we felt we literally felt like we dropped off the face of the earth and while we lived there we were experiencing the um the uh marginalization the oppression looking at the historical trauma of our native peoples looking at the 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 not only the poverty but also all the other social issues that are going on on our reservation one of the things we learned very very quickly and very early was that by and large the majority of non-native peoples who come to reservations come for one of two purposes they come to take our picture or they come to give us charity and almost no one comes to really get to know us to sit down and have a cup of coffee and then to come back and to build a longer term relationship and as I was living in this environment and I was wrestling through these emotions, I began to feel this real insecurity come over me. I, I began to, to, to question myself and feel insecure and even feel angry about different issues that were coming up. And I would talk to my, try to talk to my friends about this, my non-native friends, 
over the phone because again, they weren't coming to the reservation. And every time we had these conversations, I could feel this anger in me starting to well up and I soon would have to hang up the phone so I wouldn't start yelling at my friends. So I tried to adjust because I really wanted to talk about this. I wanted to, to find a way to have this dialogue. And so I began to disconnect myself from the stories I was telling and I began to talk about it like it was something I read in the newspaper. And then I could stay in the conversation longer, but I noticed it wasn't long before my friends started getting defensive and saying, well, I didn't do that to your people or it wasn't my family that did these things. And soon they would hang up the phones. And I wasn't able to engage this dialogue. I wasn't able to have a conversation that was honest about how I felt and what was going on within my community and actually have someone else, someone from our nation engage with me and talk about these issues. And one day I was sitting down writing a letter to my friend because this is like the 10th time I'm trying to help them understand how I was feeling and what was going on. And in this letter, I said to them, I said, being Native American and living a reservation on our country, in our country, it feels like our Native peoples are this old grandmother who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture, they're eating our food, they're having a party inside our house. Now, they've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to our bedroom, but it's much later, and we're tired, we're old, we're weak, and we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, that causes us the most pain, is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I wrote that and I'm like, that's it. That's exactly how I'm feeling. I started sharing that with people around me. Some of my, my friends and neighbors and relatives on our reservation. And some people started telling me, I've lived here for a long time, even all my life. I've never been able to fully articulate, articulate how it feels. And you just hit the nail on the head. I started communicating that to non-natives. And instead of coming back with, at me with offensive tones and anger, people were coming up to me and asking, how do I say thank you? What does it look like for myself, my family, my community, my state, even my nation to express gratitude to the indigenous hosts of Turtle Island? See, now we're having a very different dialogue. Now, instead of talking about victim versus oppressor, talking about a list of grievances and injustices, now we're talking about what I actually think is the, the primary problem our nation is facing, which is this reversal of roles, which is we have 300 million plus undocumented immigrants and ancestors of undocumented immigrants running around acting like they own the place. We have 6 million indigenous people of Turtle Island being treated as unwanted guests in someone else's house. We have to reverse those roles. I want my nation, the United States of America, to understand that in some very real and practical ways, they are guests in someone else's house and they need to be enacting that way. I want our native peoples to understand in some very real and practical ways we are the host people of the land and we need to begin stepping into our role as the host i love what happened at standing rock where we had tens of thousands of native peoples from hundreds of tribes coming together committed to the teachings of our elder to prayer and to ceremony and to peaceful protest saying in unison to this nation you can't drink oil and wash life. I love the way that we begin stepping into our role as the host people of the land. That kind of resilience was beautiful. That kind of resilience. When you have people like Deb Holland and Sharice Davis serving in the U.S. Congress, teaching their, federal, fed, their, their fellow Cong members about the history of this nation. When you have people like the Navajo Code Talkers who literally 
were coming out of boarding schools where their language was being beaten out of them by the U.S. government and then enrolling in the Marines and the Army and then using that same language to help save this nation in World War II. That's resilience. That's meaningful. That's deeply powerful. So the resilience that I'm trying to emulate, the resilience that I'm trying to, to, to have is the resilience that comes from my people, that comes from the native nations, the indigenous hosts of Turtle Island. And I'm looking for ways to engage this dialogue, to start this conversation, to be able to be absolutely and completely honest without demonizing and without otherizing and without oppressing and marginalizing the people who are now doing the oppression and the marginalization. There's a native elder, his name is George Rasmus. He's Dene from uh, the, a tribe up in Canada. And he said that where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he says, you have to start by creating a common memory. I think that quote is genius and it gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we do not have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers a mythological history of discovery, expansion, opportunity, and exceptionalism. And we have Native Americans and African Americans and other people of color and members of the LGBTQ community and, and women who have this, this vivid memory of slavery, of stolen lands and broken treaties of boarding schools, of Jim Crow laws, of mass incarceration, of internment camps, of sexist laws and oppression for your identity. And there's no common memory. The resilience I think that I've gained over the last 15 to 20 years of my life comes from watching my parents, my grandparents, from hearing stories about my ancestors who have continued to press forward, not to destroy one another, not to just get even, but to build community. So my resilience is reflected in the, the theme of my campaign, which is I want to build a nation where for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. I've been training myself for over a decade how to talk about this history, how to be honest and blunt and straightforward about it, but also how to use it not as a weapon to hurt or to oppress or to condemn people, but to use it as a tool to create a common memory and build community. And I think that resilience is reflected in that metaphor of the grandmother in the house. It's one of the best tools I've been able to develop to actually bring people into the conversation. Um, I'm so glad you were able to share all of this with us today, Mark. I, I don't want to take much more people's time up, but I did want to address one of the questions that was sent in, if we have a moment to do so. Um, for those um, listening in, uh, uh, your other supporters um, that would like to make we the people truly mean all the people. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in on how they can support you by getting your name onto the ballot. Uh, can you speak a little to that? Yes. So one of the things that I had some volunteers of our, of our uh, campaign team do a few, this is about a month and a half ago, as to, uh, running as an independent, um, you have to get your name on the ballot in all 50 states. And every state has a different signature requirement. And um, we were looking at the requirements from 2016 because the ones for 2020 are just coming out now. And I asked some of our, of our team members to look at the number of signatures required in all 50 states 
and to compare that against the 2010 census. And I wanted to know in each of the 50 states how many signatures were required and what was the number of native peoples in each state over the age of 18. And in all 50 states, the number of natives exceeded the number of signatures required. What this means is that Native America alone has the power to put me on the ballot. Now I know my support is not only going to come from Native America. It's going to come from this entire country and all the people. But for a group of people that have been so marginalized, so put out of the process, so disenfranchised from the process of voting and from having a voice, a native nation that native nations that are still treated as domestic dependents and told by the Supreme Court that because of the doctrine of discovery, they cannot reclaim sovereignty over their traditional lands. Native nations that for the first time in just the past few years has actually had meaningful engagement with presidential candidates to be able to tell our native peoples that we have the power within ourselves to put a candidate like myself on the ballot. That's incredibly empowering. And so we are beginning to, to put together teams in all 50 states. And we, what we wanna do is we want, just like I'm doing already with my campaign where I've been focusing first my first campaign event in every state that I go to, I'm trying to have my first campaign event with Native peoples or in a Native community and in interaction with the Native leaders of those nations who are there. And then we want to begin reaching out to other marginalized communities, communities of color throughout the state, and then finally go into the broader, the broader populations of each of these states. But so we want to begin, we're beginning to, to identify people in all 50 states who can help, first of all, just get the requirements for all 50 states of how many signatures are required because they change every election and what is the process and the deadlines and the timelines for this. And then we're going to begin organizing volunteers. We, our goal is to have events, um, large events in each state where we can collect signatures at those events rather than kind of going door to door or catching people on the street. Um, and we're also looking at where can we get um, signatures electronically and so on and so forth. But we're really targeting marginalized communities, native communities, communities of color, and other, other communities within these states. And so if people want to get involved with that, they can sign up on our website. They can go to markcharles2020.com and sign up as a volunteer. Um, you can make a donation to our campaign on that um, same website as well because uh, this will not be a, a inexpensive process. This is actually going to be a very expensive process to get on the ballot in all 50 states and so we, we really need people's support and so but we're putting these teams together now. We're identifying people in all 50 states and as we have money coming in we'll begin setting up offices in all these states so that we can gather these signatures. The goal is while the other two parties are doing their primaries we will be going um, and keeping a primary type schedule, traveling to all 50 states, having events in all 50 states, but rather than having primaries and caucuses in those states, we will be collecting signatures. And the goal is then by the time the conventions roll around, we will be on the ballot in all 50 states and be able to begin looking at how do we get into the debates for the general election. So that's a great question. Um, and uh, I, I uh, hope people will uh, connect with our campaign and go to our website and find out more information. We're in the process of uh, revamping our website and should have a new version up within a couple weeks, hopefully. Um, but you can still find a lot of information out there right now. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to extend uh, a moment as well for any uh, closing statements you'd like to make or any uh, final comments. Yeah, so I think my last statement I want to make is um, there's been a lot of questions uh, directed to me about why am I running as an independent? Um, wouldn't my time be better spent if I ran as a Democrat or as a Republican? And uh, my answer to that is I'm running as an independent because that is really the only place I can actually get to the White House. I've been accused many times of running a protest campaign. 
if I were running a protest campaign, I would do what Bernie Sanders did in 2016 and again in 2020, which is running as a Democrat. Um, you know, if I were running as a Democrat, I could probably have access to more donors. I could probably get more media coverage and I could be in the debates and actually change the conversation in those debates. But because of my critique of both the Democratic and the Republican Party, because of my critique of the foundations of the nation, because of my willingness not only to call out Donald Trump, but even Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I promise you the Democratic Party would never nominate me. So while I might be able to raise a few issues, I would never get nominated. And so, yes, running as an independent is the most difficult road to get to the presidency of the United States, but it is the only road that actually gives me a chance of getting there. And so I'm not running a protest campaign. I don't have a, a fatalist notion towards my campaign. I am running in this because I believe I am the most qualified person to hold this office. And I am running this campaign because I want to be president of the United States of America. And I'm running as an independent because that is the only path I have to actually get me there. And so because of that, we have a tremendous need for donations, for volunteers, for, for staff. Um, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that come much more naturally when you're running within one of the two parties in this two-party system that we have. But because we're running outside of that system, we're actually creating a lot of the things that we need even to win or to compete from scratch. We're building from the very grassroots, very much the ground up. And so if people are willing to donate to our campaign, they can go to my website, markcharles2020.com, and make the campaign donation right there. Um, we're beginning some travel again this next week. We had set a goal this month of raising $80,000. Unfortunately, we're not even close to that right now, but I haven't given up hope. And I, I would really love if we were able to raise $80,000 this month, we could begin hiring some permanent and full-time staff. And well, maybe not permanent, we can begin hiring full-time staff, people to help organize our volunteers, setting up some offices for the signature requirements and the gathering of those. And so if people are willing and able to donate, I invite you to consider giving to this campaign. So that's really the final thing I wanted to say, but I, I want people to understand that, yes, this is a long road, it's a very hard road, but um, as we were able to demonstrate at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum, when I do get put on the same stage as the other candidates, when people are actually able to hear my message, I have a message that deeply resonates with all Americans. I think there's a desire in almost every American that they want to live in a nation where we the people truly means all the people. And I'm trying to lay out the roadmap of how we can actually get there. And it's not by skirting over the flaws in our foundation, but by dealing with them head on. Something we've never been able to do as a country. But I think that's the path we have to take. And, and if I can lay that path out, the message of our campaign actually really resonates well with a lot of people. And I truly believe that we can actually get there. A Charles administration is absolutely possible. Building a nation where we the people truly means all the people is actually within our grasp. Having a national dialogue on race, gender, and class a conversation on par with the truth and reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. Something that is actually possible. We just have to find the will and the desire within ourselves to get there. I can't help my relatives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening, everyone. We really appreciate your time and uh, appreciate you staying with us while we went over. Uh, I am so grateful to have had this opportunity to sit down with Mark this evening. Uh, I want to thank you, Kina Naskomitin, and we will see you next time. Have a good evening.